pressing record right now. There we go. So um, welcome everyone to a very special seminar that we're having today. So this is a seminar that's co-sponsored by both um, the Entomology Department and the California Agriculture and Food Enterprise uh, Initiative, which is uh, the acronym is CAFE. So many of you may be familiar with this kind of group of faculty, staff, and students on campus. It's kind of an interdisciplinary um, research initiative across multiple colleges. And the goal of it is to bring people together um, working in areas of food and agriculture at UCR to answer big, broad questions of interest to, you know, that particular set of fields for the betterment of sustainability of agriculture and the planet and its people. Um, so if anybody's interested in joining CAFE or being affiliated with CAFE, um, I believe it's as simple as contacting someone like Quinn or Norm Elstrand um, and asking to be included on, um, on the mailing list so you can be involved in those activities. Um, so one of the activities that they're currently uh, running is a series of seminars on sustainability. Um, and each of these is gonna be housed in a different department and we get to be the first. Um, and funding for this is provided by the Jane S. Johnson Endowed Chair in Food and Agriculture and from UC's Global Food Initiative. So we're super pleased to have um, Dr. Maggie Douglas here for our first seminar in this series. And she's currently an assistant professor of environmental sciences at Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Um, she received her Bachelor's of Arts in Biology with a minor in philosophy from Oberlin College. And then she did both a master's degree and a PhD at Penn State University, which is where Maggie and I overlapped in our graduate studies. So I have fond memories of us trying to corral children in our bug camp program and, and <laughs> other fun things. Um, but while I was there, I had a chance to become really familiar with her work on the kind of ecology of insecticide use and it's basically the movement of insecticides in food webs um, as mediated by uh, mollusks actually. So super understudied area of research is, you know, mollusk pests in agriculture. And it turns out they actually uptake um, seed applied pesticides uh, into their bodies and, and they don't affect them, but they can be eaten by beneficial insects. And so it's a cool route by which things are entering these food webs and causing, you know, declines in biological biological control potential. Um, and so this was super groundbreaking because, you know, nobody was really looking at this route of insecticide movement. Um, and since then, she's kind of expanded her work to look at pesticide movement into pollinators um, in various different agricultural systems from local to landscape scales. And one of the cool things that Maggie is really perceptive of is thinking about, you know, the humans who are using all of these tools and these products um, and how that relates to the science and the technology that we kind of have our heads in all the time. Uh, so without further ado, I'd, I'll let Maggie start her awesome seminar on that topic and um, we'll all listen to what she has to say. Thank you, Maggie. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you for the invitation to be a part of this really exciting interdisciplinary seminar series. Um, and also thank you to Quinn and Carrie for the invitation. Um, and for that awesome introduction, Carrie, um, I kind of want you to just give the seminar <laughs> for my talk, but I'll, I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead and give it as I had planned. But um, I do think I might be the only person who has come into pollinator work through slugs. So I think that's maybe a, a sort of strange distinction that I hold. Um, but yes, today I'm going to talk to you about some more recent work related to um, pollinators, pesticides, and people the socioecology of insect declines. And so I wanted to start right off the bat with some acknowledgments. Um, the work I'm gonna to present today has truly been a collaborative and interdisciplinary effort. Um, it has benefited from the contributions of some really bright and exceptionally talented undergraduate researchers, um, Sarah Soba, Karin Shakya, and Paige Baisley. Um, and it also has benefited from a really broad and diverse group of researchers um, who came together under the umbrella of um, what we called the Pesticides and Pollinators Group through NF NSF's Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center. And I wanted to mention this in part, if there's people in the audience who are interested in doing this kind of interdisciplinary work, it's a really great resource and program to be aware of. 
Um, the, it's called SUSINC, and they have a variety of different programs um, ranging from graduate students up through um, researchers of all levels. Um, and so you can get a sense here of kind of the diversity of folks who have contributed, and I'll be kind of highlighting particular people as I move through different parts of the talk today as well. So um, probably most of you in the audience are well aware that there is mounting evidence that insects are in trouble, kind of broadly speaking. Um, and we, can, we could draw on a number of different examples to illustrate this. There are just two on this slide. On the left, you can see um, annual losses in managed honeybee colonies in the United States as documented by the Bee Informed Partnership. And you can see that um, beekeepers can expect to lose upwards of 40% of their managed colonies each year, which is quite an impressive number. Um, and then on the right, um, you can see an example for wild species. So this is a, a study that was done by researchers in Ohio drawing on citizen science data. And they documented um, that butterfly species across a wide range of species are declining on average 2% uh, per year. Um, and so these are just two examples, but we know there are many more as well. And um, pesticide use is one of several hypothesized stressors driving these losses, um, together with things like habitat loss, um, biotic threats like disease and invasive species, as well as climate change. So I think one of the real challenges of pesticide pollinator research is to understand how pesticides fit in together with all of these other stressors that may be involved. Because at this point, there's a pretty broad consensus that there's no um, one smoking gun. There's likely to be kind of interacting stressors that are uh, producing any particular um, instance of pollinator or other insect decline. And um, pesticide use though, I think it, there are some things that are somewhat unique about pesticide use as a stressor contributing to this problem. And I really appreciate, there was this recent study by London and colleagues in Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment that was kind of proposing um, an integrated way to look at pest and pollinator management. And I like this diagram because it's simple, but it just really points out that in um, agricultural production, um, you know, these things that we care about, ultimately crop yield, um, food production, depend upon the activities of several distinct groups of insects, right? We have um, pest insects, which can harm the crop and we're generally trying to control. We have predatory insects that are um, often really important in suppressing and regulating those pest populations. And then we have pollinators, which for many crops are essential to um, crop setting seed and fruit, right? And the interesting thing about um, pesticide use is that it can have effects on all three of these groups, right? Um, so it's one of these shared drivers that can influence this complicated kind of pest, predator, pollinator system. Um, and this is a fairly basic point, but you know, agriculture depends on both of these things, right? It depends on controlling, managing pest populations, and it also depends upon conserving and protecting pollinator populations. And sometimes um, finding the balance to be able to do that is not always easy. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out here is, you know, if you just look at this diagram on the left, you see all of these bugs and plants, all of these biotic things. Um, but of course, there's another organism that's important to this system, and that is the humans <laughs> that are applying the pesticides, right? Um, and so, uh, again, a fairly basic point, but I just want to point out there's, there's important both ecological drivers as well as social drivers that come into play when we're trying to understand why pesticides are being applied in a particular cropping system and time and place. So to help kind of untangle and start to describe um, these complex relationships uh, between both the social and ecological dimensions of this pesticide pollinator relationship, um, colleagues and I, as part of this broader succinct effort, uh, developed what we called a socio-ecological framework for pesticide pollinator interactions. Um, and I wanna mention that this framework was really led by Doug Sponsler, who at the time was a postdoc at Penn State and now is at, um, has gone overseas and is a postdoc in Europe. Um, and as a group, we decided that we could understand these pesticide pollinator relationships by dividing the whole system into three kind of domains. On the one hand, we have pesticide use. So here we're thinking about all of the processes that, um, precipitate the use of pesticides in the environment. So this includes pest pressure, right, which is 
more or less an ecological phenomenon, but it also includes things like the availability of pesticides as well as alternative methods of pest control, as well as the information and values of the person applying the pesticides, right? So all of those both social and ecological factors combine to produce these uh, patterns of pesticide use in space and time, which leads us into kind of domain number two, which is pesticide exposure. So if we can understand the patterns of pesticide use in space and time, combine that with what we know about patterns of pollinator activity, then we can start to understand where they intersect, which we would consider exposure. And then that leads us into an understanding of pesticide effects, right? So once we can characterize exposure, we can combine that information with um, knowledge about the toxicity of these products to pesticides, and then understand the effects on those pollinators and, and ultimately the ecosystem functions and services they provide both in agricultural systems as well as in natural and semi-natural systems, right? Okay, so my goal uh, this afternoon, evening for me, afternoon for you, is gonna be to kind of um, walk through this framework a little bit and um, illustrate some work that I've been doing with colleagues over the past several years to kind of tackle different parts of this framework and see what we might glean by putting it all together. Okay, so I'm actually gonna start with this box um, that's kind of you know, putting together uh, pesticide use and exposure, which is uh, spatiotemporal patterns of pesticide use. And so there are two kind of guiding questions here. And from this point in the talk forward, I'm really gonna focus on insecticides, even though um, of course herbicides and fungicides can also have important effects on pollinators, but um, insecticides has been the main focus of my work. And I think also makes sense as a starting place because of their um, exceptional kind of toxicity to insects, including pollinators. So some of the things that we wanna understand are, you know, how are insecticides distributed across the US landscape? And how has insecticide use changed over time in the past 25 or so years? Um, if we were in an in-person seminar, this is the time I would probably ask you to like raise your hands or um, get a sense of the audience ideas about this. Um, that's a little bit tricky to do on Zoom, but if you wanna share your predictions, um, feel free to do so in the chat. Um, you could also give, you know, use an up emoji or down emoji if you want to uh, let me know what you think is happening with insecticide use in the US over the past 25 years or so. Do you think it's going up? Do you think it's going down? What do you think is generally happening? Okay, we've got a few suggestions here in the chat. I'll give you another second in case anyone wants to chime in. Okay, so this is pretty interesting. If you look just at the, the messages in the chat so far, you can see that they are kind of all over the map, right? Some people think that insecticide use is going down. Some people think that it's going up. Some people think that um, maybe less is being used, but it, the ones that are being used are more efficient. Um, some think that, you know, related point that maybe the doses of pesticides that are being used are changing. Um, and this is really interesting because it actually reflects, I think, a broader kind of um, disagreement that we see both in the popular literature and in the scientific literature. So, um, and I kind of call these, you know, dissonant stories about U.S. insecticide use. And you can see some examples here. So a few years ago, um, science had a special is issue focused on pest management, which was very exciting to me because it doesn't happen every day that science focuses on pest management. And in the kind of front matter of the magazine or the journal, they had some kind of summary figures. And um, here's one that you can see. You, well, first of all, you can see their conclusion is getting safer using less, right? And to support that conclusion, they're showing us a graph that shows millions of kilograms of um, insecticides applied over time in the US. And you can see um, this general declining trend and especially in the organophosphate insecticides, but also insecticides as a whole. And then over here on the right, you can see um, that insecticide use in kilograms per hectare has been declining, while at the same time, the percentage of 
crops in Bt corn, so this is corn genetically modified to be resistant to insects, has been increasing. So the implication here being that as Bt crops, especially corn, has been adopted, we've seen a decline in insecticide use. And as someone who worked for a while in uh, pest management and field crops, I can tell you that that is a pretty widely held perception in many quarters. But then on the other hand, we have, you know, down the New York Times Magazine, the insect apocalypse is here. This and many other kind of popular media portrayals of what's going on with insects um, very often kind of highlight pesticides as a driving force and suggest that pesticides are actually increasing and being used more frequently and in larger amounts. Um, as I mentioned, it's interesting, even in the scientific literature, you kind of see this disagreement. So um, there are some studies that suggest that uh, insecticide use has been going down, especially in corn and cotton. Um, on the other hand, you have some other studies suggesting that insecticide use is going up, especially in corn and soybeans, right? So this is quite confusing. It doesn't seem possible that um, insecticide use is going both down and up um, at the same time in the same crops. But um, what I'm a kind of spoiler alert is actually everybody here is right <laughs> in, in one way or another, okay? And I'll explain sort of why. Um, one reason is because insecticide use is a really complex phenomenon. And that means that we can measure it in different ways. There are a diversity of data sources um, that can be drawn upon to try and characterize it. And we can think about it at different scales and in different contexts. And depending on the combination of things that you use, you can come to different conclusions, even using kind of valid, you know, approaches. And so in a recent paper, um, you know, I suggested that we could better understand insecticide use by breaking it into a few different components. Um, on the one hand, we can think about the extent of land that is treated with insecticides. And so the kind of variables feeding into that would be how much cropland is there in the landscape and how much of that cropland is being treated with insecticides. And those things um, in combination can describe the extent of treated area. On the other hand, we can also think about the intensity of insecticide use on those acres that are treated. So to understand that, we can understand the application rate. So the amount in you know, kilograms, let's say, per treated uh, hectare, and then combined with the potency, in other words, how much of that pesticide does it take to kill an insect? Because we know that insects, insecticides are not created equal. Some are far more potent than others. And so it's really important that we take this potency or um, insect toxicity into account. And so if we combine both kind of this application rate and potency, we can arrive at an intensity, um, which I'm suggesting kind of operationally, we can define as the number of lethal doses applied per hectare, right? And so these things taken together, both the extent of insecticide use and the intensity, um, we can think of as insect toxic load, how much is loading to a particular landscape. Um, and, you know, if we kind of step back from this for a minute, you know, the interpretation here is, you know, how many insect toxic doses are contained in a given amount of insecticides applied. And um, for the purposes of my work so far, I've focused on um, toxicity to the honeybee, in part because it's an important pollinating species, in part because it's a standard species used in regulatory processes, and so we have better um, toxicity data for that species than for many others. But um, a preliminary kind of analysis uh, using this framework, um, the goals of this were to assess patterns in what we're calling here bee toxic load, which is just the honeybee lethal doses um, in, on either a contact or an oral basis from 1997 to 2012. And I started by assessing both national trends and also county trends. A second goal here was to describe variation in those trends among agricultural production regions. And then finally, to identify the relative contribution of factors responsible for these changes. So, um, you know, how do those different elements explain the changes that we see? And so to do this, um, you know, this required kind of synthesizing data from a number of different public data sources. Uh, we have data for pretty much all of these dimensions, but they're kind of scattered in different repositories. So it meant drawing on data from the Census of Agriculture at USDA together with the USGS Pesticide National Synthesis Project, which provides pesticide data. 
um, and toxicity data from both Ecotox and the pesticide properties database, which is um, affiliated with the university in the UK. So all of these data were kind of brought together in a data processing pipeline in R, which is published alongside the data set. So if you're curious about the nitty gritty behind it, you can go and check that out. And so what do we find? Um, I'm gonna start with the national trends. And I think this really illustrates the importance of units, right? So um, here on the left, you can see if we just look at the weight of insecticides applied, then indeed we see that there's generally this declining trend. And this fits together with that graph that we saw in science, right? Showing that overall insecticide use is declining. But if we translate that insecticide use into toxic doses to bees, what we see is that on a contact basis, insecticide use has been basically constant over this time period. And on an oral basis, insecticide use has actually dramatically increased. And um, the different colors contributing to the bars correspond to different insecticide classes. And so you can see that particularly for the oral toxic load pattern, the neonicotinoids are really driving the story there, which makes sense because neonics have um, exceptional toxicity to bees, especially on an oral basis. Okay, so I've shown you the national trends, but now we can look a little bit more fine-grained at the county scale. And so here I'm showing you um, the, the kind of um, snapshot in 2012 for contact toxic load. And you can see that um, it's highest basically in fruit producing regions. So here in the Central Valley of California, down in Florida, as well as in cotton producing regions. That's where you see, tend to see kind of the most concentration. Um, when we look at the change in the contact toxic load, it kind of matches what we saw at the natural, national scale, which is that it's sort of a mixed bag, right? There were 51% um, of counties where it increased, 49% of counties where it decreased, the median change was about 5%. So not really drastic change going on here. Um, when we look, we can kind of aggregate these data regionally and we found no significant trend in most regions. Um, although we did see an increase in the Northern Great Plains, which you see kind of up here, um, but that was the only one. The rest of them were more or less static. But we see a really different pattern when we look at oral toxic load. So here you can see that we, it's really concentrated in the Midwest. These are those grain producing regions. Um, and also if we look at the change over time, we can see that um, that increase, which here these dark red areas are showing a really large increase in oral toxic load. We can see that's really, really concentrated in what we typically consider to be like the corn belt, right? So here, the story is pretty different. We see that oral toxic load increased in 87% of counties and decreased in 13% of counties. And the median change was a 15-fold increase, so pretty significant change. Um, we also saw that this increase, it occurred in almost all regions, but was especially acute in the heartland, which makes sense, this area that we see in the Corn Belt, as well as in the Northern Great Plains again. I just want to point out one thing that's interesting about the Northern Great Plains is that is a region that historically honeybees have often, um, migratory honeybee colonies have often spent a lot of time in the summer. So um, that's a region where it's perhaps particularly concerning to see increases in kind of insecticide loading relative to honeybee toxicity. Okay, so if we kind of summarize this section, we can see that there's a shifting landscape of insecticide hazard to bees um, in the US. So the heartland and the Northern Great Plains have seen particularly dramatic increase, increases in bee toxic load, especially on an oral basis, oral toxicity basis. You can kind of see that um, illustrated in these insect graphs as well. Um, there also, you know, this change resulted from both an increase in the area that's treated with insecticide. So there's more acres being treated now than in the past but also there's increasing potency to bees. And that increasing potency ha has been a really big part of the driving force here. Um, this means that the relative hazard of crops in regions is shifting. Um, and you know, in particular, we can see that neonic seed treatments in corn and soybeans is the clear driver here. Pretty much every piece of evidence points in that direction. Um, and this is interesting because historically, um, fruit and vegetable crops have been thought of as much more insecticide intensive than uh, corn, soybeans, wheat, these field crops. 
And so this really is a significant shift in the landscape if we're seeing these large acreage, um, you know, grain crops like corn and soybeans uh, receiving more insecticide doses from a bee's perspective. Okay, so at this point, you may be wondering, I know I'm often wondering, you know, when I get to this point, what is driving the increase in neonic treated seed in these field crops, right? So we've described the spatiotemporal pattern, but we don't really understand the why behind it. And this brings us back up into this kind of first part of the framework having to do with um, things like pest pressure, pesticide availability, and the information and values of the applicators. And it raises this question, I think in particular, of do farmers have a different relationship to seed treatments than they do to conventional pesticides and insecticides in particular? And so um, just to make sure we're all on the same page, probably many of you are already familiar with this, but in, in case not, um, neonic insecticides, you know, these are highly toxic to insects, generally have pretty low toxicity to mammals. Um, they're systemic, which means that as a seed treatment, they're applied kind of on the outside of the seed and then get taken up into all the tissues of the plant. Um, they're also quite long lasting, especially in soil. So they can persist for over a year. You know, the half-life of some of these active ingredients in the soil is over a year. And we've seen kind of um, long-term contamination at some sites with a history of neonic use. And we know at this point, you know, originally the hope was that um, these seed treatments would be a targeted kind of insecticide application with few non-target impacts. But unfortunately, what we've learned through research over the past, you know, 10, 15 years is that um, there are some significant roots of pollinator exposure to neonics. Um, they can be exposed, you know, for soil nesting species, they may be exposed that way. They can also be exposed to planting dust that's generated at planting time. Um, as well as through pollen and nectar of plants that have taken up the insecticide, either the crop plant that was treated or wild plants that are growing in the immediate area. Um, from a farmer perspective, you know, these seed treatments are targeting these sporadic early season insects. Whoops, not sure why. Let me go back here. Okay, sorry about that. Um, they're targeting these sporadic early season insect pests. So. Um, things like bean leaf beetle and seed corn maggot. These are not pests that farmers typically expect to show up every year, um, but they're there sometimes and they can be troublesome when they are. Um, and another important thing to recognize about seed treatments is that they're often packaged with other pesticide active ingredients. So here I'm showing you on the left an example of a pesticide label for Evicta Complete Corn, which is a pretty common um, seed treatment that's used in corn. And you can see here, it contains um, thiamethoxam, which is a neonicotinoid, but it also includes an nematicide called uh, abamectin. It also includes four different fungicide active ingredients, right? So um, when you think about your, what a farmer is getting when they get a treated seed, it's really a package rather than an individual active ingredient, which is an important point that will come up in a minute. Okay, so um, in previous work, we found that most neonics are used on corn and soybean and they're virtually all seed applied. So just to give you some um, additional background in this particular use, um, here is the use over time of all neonics combined by crop. And you can see that uh, corn and soybean are really driving the show. Um, through a separate analysis, we estimated that by 2011, um, 79 to 100% of corn acres were treated. This is up from only about 30% of corn acres that were treated with any insecticide in the 1990s. Okay, so this is a pretty significant um, increase in the extent of insecticide use. Um, also, uh, 34 to 44% of soybean acres were treated at that time, which is up from only about 1% of soybean acres being treated in the 90s. Um, I should say that insecticide use on soybean has expanded somewhat because of the soybean aphid and some um, more recently introduced pests, but even so, this still constitutes a pretty considerable expansion of insecticide use, which has only gone up since 2011. Um, in fact, from 2011 to 2014, we see that neonic use has increased by about 50%. Okay, so, you know, going back to kind of our original um, flow chart of, you know, what explains pesticide use patterns, an obvious question is, you know, was this pattern driven by pests? Was there something that changed in the pest environment that led farmers to need to use a lot more insecticide? 
Um, there's no obvious new pest pressure that would explain this kind of drastic increase in the extent of insecticide use. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, a lot of research since this time has demonstrated that there's minimal yield benefit often in these crops. So it really doesn't appear that pests are driving the show on this one, although they are sometimes in other cropping systems, right? But in this particular um, insecticide use pattern, it doesn't seem to be the case. So this kind of points us towards, again, that social dimension of that, of these drivers and um, led me and colleagues to ask, you know, what do we know about farmers' relationship to pesticide treated seed? Um, this part of the work was done in collaboration with um, several colleagues, mostly agricultural economists, led by um, Claudia Hitaj. And the main questions that we were interested in here were, um, do farmers know more about field applied pesticides than seed treatments? And do farmers have a good understanding of what their seed treatment contains? So to answer these questions, we drew on the Agricultural Resource Management Survey, which is a farmer survey conducted by USDA. And this survey um, historically did not have questions about seed treatments in it, but starting in 2015, they did start to add some questions related to seed treatments. And so um, we were able to draw on those questions, especially because several of the co-authors here were working for USDA at the time we were doing these analyses. And so they were able to get access to kind of the um, raw data that gave us a lot of insight into um, what farmers were really saying when they were asked these questions about seed treatment use. So the first question we tried to address was, you know, a pretty simple one. Can farmers name the pesticide applied on a sample field? So here, you know, when a farmer is part of this survey, there's a field that um, is identified kind of randomly and then the farmer asks answers questions associated with the input use on that field. And one of those questions is, you know, whether a pesticide was used and what type of pesticide was used. So what you can see here is on the x-axis, we have different crops that were part of the survey in different years and um, responses either for seed treatment or for field applied pesticides. And um, here on the y-axis is the farmer's response to pesticide product questions. So what you can see is if you just focus on the field applied pesticides for a moment, which is the right hand bar in each of these pairs, you can see that for field applied pesticides, upward of 97% of farmers could easily provide the name of the pesticide that was applied in the field. But when you look at the seed treatment side of the equation, that's not the case, right? So we can see there's some variability, but in wheat, for example, only in winter wheat, um, only 43% of farmers were able to name the pesticide used as a seed treatment. Um, and then, you know, the greatest percentage could name it in cotton, but that was still only 84%. So we're seeing that there's a significant group of farmers for each of these crops um, that are uncertain about the seed treatment that's being used in their field. Okay, and then a secondary kind of related question is, you know, if farmers know, you know, the name of the product, do they also know what type of seed treatment they're using? So what kind of active ingredients it contains? And so um, there were actually for parts of this survey for cotton and corn, uh, farmers were asked both, you know, whether they were using a seed treatment and the name of the product, but also whether the product was an insecticide, a fungicide or an amaticide, or, you know, contained active ingredients with any of those properties. And so because of those kind of two different questions, we were able to explore to what degree farmers, you know, what they said about the name of the product they use matched, you know, what that product contains in terms of being an insecticide, a fungicide, or a nematicide. And what we found was that um, 15 to 35% of the time, the responses did not align. So in other words, a farmer might say they used a particular seed treatment and then also tell, tell us that it was contained a fungicide when in fact that wasn't the case, right? So there were pretty prevalent mismatches here. And I wanna draw your attention particular, there's kind of two ways that they could mismatch. One is false positives, which means that a farmer thinks that they were using a seed treatment with say a nematicide, but it turns out that the product that they listed does not contain a nematicide. And that happened, for example, in cotton for nematicides 27% of the time. Um, false positive responses suggest a missed opportunity for pest management. 
Like maybe the farmer really wanted to control nem nematodes. Maybe there was a good reason to control nematodes and they thought they were controlling them with a seed treatment, but they actually weren't, right? On the other hand, you can have false negatives. Um, a false negative would be a situation where a farmer didn't think that their seed treatment included an insecticide, but in fact it did, right? And we can see that this occurred, we estimated about 13% of the time in cotton. Um, false negatives suggest an unnecessary cost to the farmer, and they also suggest an unnecessary environmental impact, right? Because they maybe weren't looking to use an insecticide anyway. Um, also, just this general degree of mismatching really calls into question the quality of the survey data, right? If farmers don't have a solid understanding of the products they're using and what they contain, then um, going to farmers to get this kind of information is going to be inherently kind of problematic. Okay, and I, I lastly on this part, I wanted to highlight some um, findings that came out of a separate um, farmer survey. This was actually a farmer survey that was uh, funded by the pesticide industry. So it was done kind of at the behest of the pesticide manufacturers. And, um, but it contained some really interesting findings. Among them, um, you know, 39% of corn growers and 47% of soybean growers were not targeting any particular pest when they used a seed treatment. And um, they also had an interesting question about farmers who would reduce their use if they were given the choice. And 20, about 20% 20 of corn growers and 15% of soybean growers said that that was the case. So what this says to me is that the drivers for seed treatment use appear to be upstream from the farm. And I think one reason why this is perhaps happening is because of consolidation in the seed chemical industry. Um, as some of you may be aware, over the past 20 to 25 years, um, chemical manufacturers have purchased seed companies. And so there's been really a merger between the chemical and the seed input uh, manufacturers. Um, and also there's just been general consolidation in that field overall. So there's really only three or four companies that are controlling most of the pesticides as well as most of the seeds. Um, so some of this seems to be driven more upstream at the sort of seed and chemical industry side of things. It also um, lets us know that part of what's happening here is that seed treatment is the default option. Farmers, most of the time, are not applying these products themselves. They're purchasing a seed which is pre-treated, um, which means they're not taking as active a role in the use of seed treatments. And um, what we've documented here is a lack of farmer knowledge and choice. So in some cases, farmers actually would like to make a different choice, but they lack um, access to those options. And this is just sort of anecdotal, but I can tell you about um, this is a picture of Lucas Cresswell, who's a farmer um, in Pennsylvania who I've worked with uh, for some time. And Lucas, because of the work that Carrie previously described about some of the negative effects of neonics on slug biocontrol, Lucas decided to move away from seed treatments and he's dropped them from his operation as far as he can. But often he's communicated this frustration that he's not always able to get untreated seed when he wants it, right? So um, there's sort of an issue going on there with both lack of farmer knowledge as well as choice. And I kind of rolled into that, I would say also these things have a relatively low cost to the farmer. And that cost is also quite opaque because the seed treatment is kind of rolled into the larger package of what they're purchasing together with the seed. Okay, and one last point I wanna make that's a little bit tangential here is about um, seed treatment data. And that is that as of 2015, there is no longer any public data in the US on seed applied pesticides. Um, most of the analyses I shared with you so far were derived from USGS uh, data, but the source of that data stopped including seed treatments in 2015. And the reason they stopped including them was because they no longer really trusted the, the um, quality of the data because of these very issues of farmers being uncertain of what they were really using. Um, USDA has started collecting some data, but it's not really publicly available. Um, and what this means is that there's a huge pesticide data gap as it relates to seed treatments. Um, this figure on the left is showing for this USGS source data, these are several active ingredients that are used uh, frequently as seed treatments. And what you can see is up until 2014 when seed treatments were included is in blue, and then in red is after seed treatments have been excluded. And you can see for clothianidin, for example, which is a neonicotinoid, you can see that virtually all of the use of clothianidin is seed treatments because once the seed treatments are left out, 
that those bars virtually disappear, right? So what we're looking at here is the fingerprint of a huge data gap. Um, and you know, this project has taught me nothing else. It's just the value of high quality public pesticide data. So I think we really need to be aware of that. Um, and also, you know, the lack of farmer knowledge and options challenges both data collection as well as integrated pest management. It's really hard for farmers to implement an IPM plan if they're not even sure kind of what products they're applying together, together with their seeds. Okay, so we've spent a lot of time in these first two domains. Um, now I wanna shift towards uh, the pesticide, pesticide effects side of the equation. Um, so of course, documenting these patterns of use in the landscape is one thing, but finding out what they actually mean for pollinators and other um, beneficial organisms is a whole other can of worms. Um, and to do that really requires putting together these patterns of pesticide occurrence and toxicity together with patterns of pollinator activity. Um, I wanted to highlight, because this is a largely California audience, I wanted to highlight an ongoing effort that I wanna say, you know, I have not been very directly involved in at all, but I just think is a really cool example of what you can do when high quality pesticide use data are available. Um, and that's because California has a really unique pesticide reporting system, which means that your state has better pesticide use data than probably anywhere else in the world, honestly. Um, and so this is work that Eric Lonsdorf and, and others have been working on to try and harness that um, pesticide use data to get a better understanding of what's going on in the landscape and how pollinators might be affected. So the, the basic idea here to build a mechanistic model of bee exposure is to combine knowledge of pesticide application together with what we know about bee foraging in the landscape to predict exposure to bees. Um, then those predictions can be compared to kind of experimental observations of pesticides found in experimental bumblebee hives to understand whether the model fit is good. Um, this is an animation that's just showing you. So um, this on the right is for these three counties in California, Yolo, Calusa, and Solano counties. Um, the little bright blips that you see coming and going are particular pesticides being used in the landscape. What's really cool about the, the California pesticide data is that it's available at the parcel level, so almost down to an individual field. And also it's in a very fine scale temporal grain. So you can find out down to the day that it's applied. And that means that you can really characterize this very dynamic kind of uh, landscape of pesticide exposure that bees and other pollinators might be exposed to. So I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna jump ahead here just to say that, um, so these researchers, they've taken these predictions of pesticides in the landscape and then they've um, compared them to um, patterns of uh, contamination of pollen of uh, bumblebee hives that were put out experimentally across the landscape. And what they're finding so far is that there is quite a lot of compound specific variation, but also that observed exposure does correspond to predictions to some degree, which I think is really exciting because this is really not, you know, is, Kind of a more mechanistic understanding of this than I think we've seen before. So right now um, these colleagues are exploring kind of adjustments and improvements to account for some of this compound specific variation, but I'm really excited about this as an example of what we could do if we had really high quality pesticide data. Um, but in the meantime, you know, I work in Pennsylvania primarily and I'm also interested in other parts of the country. We don't have this awesome California pesticide use data set here, so, you know, my question is, can we relate pesticides to pollinator effects, even in the absence of such fine scale, really highly resolved pesticide use data? So um, to begin to try and do that, um, I've been working on kind of pulling together the available data that we have, mostly that comes from various um, government data sources, again, including USGS, as well as USDA's land cover data. And the basic idea here is that if we have an idea of um, where, you know, how much of particular pesticides are used on particular crops and can translate those into units of bee toxicity, we can then map them to the landscape and start to get a more fine scale, fine grained understanding or prediction of pesticide loading, which then could be used to relate to pollinator outcomes. So um, 
I'm gonna, this is way too complicated to go through and I don't expect you to, to kind of absorb it all. But uh, my main point here is just that this is a complicated effort <laughs> that involves relating many different data sets to one another. Um, I'm trying my best to do this all in a kind of reproducible way in R and planning to kind of document and share all of that at the, at the point of publication. But just to give you an idea of some of the outputs of this type of analysis, here you can see for Pennsylvania, uh, CropScape, the cropland data layer, which just shows patterns of, um, of land use in the landscape. And then taking these um, data from USGS on pesticide application together with acreage data from USDA, um, what we can start to do is predict the use of either particular compounds on the landscape. So here's a map of predicted glyphosate use in kilograms per, per hectare. Um, and we can also start to map kind of this aggregated insecticide loading in units of bee toxic load. And that's what you see down here on the bottom two panels. So maps like this then can feed into these pollinator analyses and be related to pollinator outcomes. And just to give you a couple of quick examples, I, I don't want to go over my time here, but um, you know, one test case, this is being led by Melanie Kammerer, um, who investigated this question of how land use together with climate shapes wild bee abundance and species richness. Um, she drew on monitoring data from USGS native bee inventory and monitoring lab led by Sam Drogi. And she investigated um, insecticide loading together with several other potential explanatory variables, right? Things like floral nesting resources in the landscape, climate and weather variables, and also topography. And um, this is sort of a complex diagram that shows she broke the analysis up into both seasonally kind of, you know, bee abundance during different times of year, as well as taxonomically different genera that you can see, as well as kind of ecological guilds. And then on the left hand side here, you can see several of the predictor variables that she included and the, you know, saturation density of the blue indicates how predictive a particular variable was for a particular outcome. And um, what I want to draw to your attention is that you will, will not see insecticide loading on the list of variables here. And that's because it was not explanatory in this data set. So it turned out for this particular data set, the most important predictors were climate and weather variables. Um, and insecticide loading just didn't seem to be important in this particular data set. One thing I want to point out here is that in the landscapes um, that these samples were collected, um, the surrounding land use was about 39% natural, 16% agricultural, and 45% developed. So maybe this isn't so surprising, right? Because these sites were not so much focused in agricultural landscapes. But I think it does kind of raise an important point, which is that we shouldn't always assume that pesticides are the driver and that in a particular landscape, especially in landscapes that don't have a lot of agricultural production, there may be other drivers that are more important. Okay, now there, here's another test case. Um, this is cucurbits in the Midwest, and this is a project that Eli Bloom was, has been leading. Best name ever for a pollinator ecologist, I would say. Um, and he was looking at concentrations of pesticide residues in leaves and flowers of cucurbit crops kind of throughout this Midwestern bunch of different sites situated in the landscape, and also floral visitation by wild and managed bees. And he also included insecticide loading as one of the variables in this analysis. And in this case, he found that both local and landscape insecticide loading were negatively related to wild bee visitation. Um, so here you can see on the x-axis, here was um, local kind of insecticide um, concentration. Here on the right-hand panel is insecticides in the landscape. So kind of this loading in the broader surrounding area. And in both cases, he saw a significant uh, negative relationship on the one hand with wild bee visitation and on the other for bumblebees in particular. Um, I, there's one more example I was gonna talk about, but I think I'm out of time. So I'm gonna skip over this one um, and just offer a few concluding thoughts. So, you know, one of my take home messages here is that high quality pesticide data are a public good. And I think that that could be recognized more broadly. Um, these data have a lot of value, not only in this realm of pollinator pesticide interactions, but for human health, for water quality, 
and also for agricultural industries themselves to get an understanding of how they're changing over time and space. Um, also, I want to suggest that protecting pollinators might start farther upstream than we normally think about, right? So we might need to start paying attention to some of these upstream processes up in domain one, things like um, what kinds of pest, how are pest pressures changing? You know, invasive species might be an important driver in some systems, but also we need to pay attention to the people, you know, what's going on to, with um, the availability of both pesticides and alternatives, as well as the information and values that those applicators hold. And then lastly, I'd like to suggest that um, putting pesticides on the map in this way, I think can help us to prioritize crops and areas for mitigation, um, as well as for conservation. And um, it can also help us to evaluate pesticides relative to other stressors and get a more holistic understanding of what's driving some of these insect declines. Um, so with that, thank you very much for your attention. I think I've gone a little bit over my time already, um, but I would be happy to take questions if we have a few moments for it. Thank you very much, Maggie. That was excellent. My child has arrived, so she will be asking questions as well. Does anyone have questions? You can put them in the chat. Let's see, Ben Sumner asks, how did bees survive when DDT and other OCPs were in use? Yeah, well, you know, that's an interesting question um, in part. So what's interesting about that is that neonics are actually way more toxic to bees than DDT. Um, or most of the older pesticide classes. So, you know, one of the interesting things about kind of the evolution of insecticide use over time is that the older insecticide classes tend to have greater toxicity to uh, mammals, including people, and actually lower toxicity to insects. So they were not as efficient as, um, you know, as pesticides. Um, whereas, you know, neonics, it takes a very, very tiny amount of a neonic to kill a bee. That's just the, it, so in a sense, it means it's a very efficient um, insecticide, but it also means that uh, we're kind of playing with fire a little bit in the sense that it's really hard to prevent, you know, non-target insects from being exposed. So yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if that, hopefully that answers your question. Other questions for Maggie? Uh, yes, this is Deborah. Hi, Deborah. Um, yeah, hi. You made a very important point um, about the farmer uh, lacking option. Um, not only that, but with um, with the citrus nursery in California, um, actually, in their case, uh, they need to follow the state regulation and they need to apply uh, neonics before they ship out their nursery trees. So um, we had some discussion with them and they were saying, you know, we don't want to apply those. Give me an alternative and I'm gonna use it. But if the law says I need to use it, they don't have any option. Yeah, so, you're talking about nursery production? Is yeah, that yeah. Yep. And, and what the regulation that requires them to apply it, is that related to um, preventing invasive species introduction or what? Um, it's about HLB, um, Huang Lombin, the disease that is destroying uh, um, the citrus uh, yep. all over the world. Yeah. So CDFA, the California Department of Food and Agriculture, is saying, uh, yeah, there is a regulation. You need to apply before you ship it out. Yeah. Yeah, that is a, that's a really challenging situation. And I think, that's a, I think that's a great example where there's a role there, I think, for um, pest management researchers in extension to really put some energy into like, are there alternative methods of controlling, you know, dealing with that pest of concern? Because that's a good example where, um, you know, the use is being driven by a very legitimate need, right? And yeah. so- yeah. If you can come up with some alternative way to address that, then that may help to resolve the issue. Um, I can give you just an example, and I think somebody else uh, was asking about how to improve kind of the upstream part. Um, and I, I've given you the kind of field crops example, which unfortunately is a little bit discouraging, but there are some more encouraging examples 
And I think that one is um, actually fruit production in Pennsylvania. So where I live, I'm like one county over from the fruit belt of Pennsylvania where most of the apples and pears and peaches and things are grown. And in that system, they've been really challenged by a whole sequence of invasive pests, right? They've got brown marmorated stink bug. They've got um, now spotted lanternfly is kind of coming into the system. And those new invasive pests can really undo a lot of IPM progress, right? So the, the cool thing is that there's a research and extension center, which is based right in that fruit belt, which works really closely together with the growers and has been able to kind of consistently adapt and identify alternatives and also identify ways to use neonics in a way that is lower risk to pollinators, right? So they help them identify which are the least harmful options. How can, at what time can they be applied to minimize risk to the pollinator? So I guess that would be another question in your nursery example is like, you know, who is studying the downstream, you know, like how much of that that's on the, um, nursery plants is still persisting, you know, at the time that those plants reach their destination and are blooming and potentially coming into contact with pollinators is so, you know, there's a few points of intervention there. There's like, can you generate alternatives to address the problem? And then there's also like, can you understand um, the roots of exposure and mitigate that somehow, right? So I, I wish I had an easy answer for you, but I think that there are, um, you know, those are just highlighting really important places where we need like public research to address those problems and help growers navigate what are often really compelling and important um, pest problems. Yeah, thank you so much. Let's try to get a couple more questions in here real quick. Um, so Jessica McCraw asks, what are some examples of ways to improve on the upstream, specifically the people part? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, for me, one thing that was really interesting about all these collaborations is um, working with um, economists and sociologists. And, you know, one thing that was very humbling about that was just realizing the complexity on the social side as well, right? So oftentimes we have intuitions, I think, that are not entirely correct. <laughs> um, and, and so just kind of giving, um, creating space for that kind of research and advocating for its importance, I think is kind of one step forward. Um, but then I think too, you know, so I think the example I just gave about the apples in Pennsylvania maybe is one example of kind of improving the upstream, right? So there you have a really healthy kind of research and extension IPM program that's really closely connected to that group of growers. And they are able to work together collaboratively both to help the growers manage their pest problems and also protect the pollinators that actually they rely on in that system, right? Because it's a highly pollinator dependent crop. Um, so I think that's, you know, I think there is a role there in the research and extension side. I also think some of this is regulatory, you know, um, some of it is gonna come down to uh, decisions that need to be made at even a higher level and maybe suggest a place for scientists communicating with policymakers and helping them understand um, so I wonder about, you know, on the sea treatments, I wonder about things like improving labeling, improving transparency of pricing for the farmers, improving availability of untreated seed. You know, those are all places where we could have a different system, right? Um, but we don't, but, you know, there are a whole number of different ways. Um, as, and those are kind of regulatory, but there's also incentives, right? So, so entities like NRCS, have a lot of incentive programs that help farmers do things for soil conservation, for example, and they're just starting to get into pollinator protection and, and incentivizing actions for pollinator protection, but maybe that could include changes to pest management, right? Um, and I know there have been some moves in that direction, some with more or less success, but I think it's something that's worth, you know, doing and keeping an eye on. I think we have time for one more question. Do you want to take a gander at the chat and, and pick your favorite? Okay, yeah. <laughs> click them over. They're all really great questions. I so. know. Or a synthesis answer. We have one about um, are the insecticides working? And then also uh, vector control. So like for mosquitoes, is that having an impact? So that's kind of an urban question. Yeah. And then challenges overall. Yeah, I think so. I can kind of quickly address, I mean, so the insect populations question is interesting. Um, 
in terms of responses from the insect populations, there's some that are developing resistance. Um, so thrips in the southeast would be an example of that. Um, there's some evidence that they may be suppressing in a long-term way some pest populations and soybean aphid is the one um, where maybe that's happening. Um, the, the evidence on that is uh, sketchy, I would say. So I'm not totally convinced, but it's possible that they are reducing soybean aphid populations. Um, vector control is such an important point and it, it really raises a much larger point, which is that everything I've told you about during this talk is all about agricultural pesticide use. And we have zero public data for urban pesticide use, for municipal pesticide use, you know, forestry applications. All of that is kind of a black box. So if I could kind of dream my, you know, federal pesticide reporting program, it would also include some of those urban and municipal um, programs because there is some interesting evidence um, that vector control, for example, at least locally in certain situations has had an impact on pollinators, but I don't think we have enough information to know how widespread of an issue that may be. And Carrie's right, you can never get rid of aphids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again, Maggie. That was such a great seminar and a great discussion. Um, if anybody else has questions for Maggie, I'd be happy to hook you up with her email address. Now that she's done teaching, she has tons of time, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm like, I'm time, really, right? Yeah. So let's thank her again, and um, everyone have a great day. And thanks so okay. much to all of you for the great questions and for being here on another Zoom thing when you could be doing something else. And thank you to CAFE for um, sponsoring this event. Thank you so much.